Okay, so what you're hearing... This is from the soundtrack of Curious George. Um, it's called Upside Down. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, and so this will be running through my head as I'm giving this presentation. So for those of you that know this song, let it run through yours as well. What's impossible Laid back, but it's about the fact that this world keeps we need to remain curious and understand that we can do things different and we can go places where people say we can't go. We just have to try. And as the surface breaks reflection. Let's go ahead and flip it. <clears throat> you know, when I was listening to Janet yesterday um, talk about the different words we use around thought leadership, and you know, are we a thinker? Are we a leader? It kind of took me back to the fact that this is really nothing new. 2,500 years or so ago, Plato wrote about philosopher kings. These were people who really trained and developed themselves as philosophers, but they were also leaders. They were also responsible for taking care of the people around them. And there's this very powerful notion that we carried in our Western tradition around thought leadership or being a philosopher king or being an intellectual with a social component to what we do. So if you don't like the word thought leader, that's OK, right? But it's been with us. And what I really like about where we are in the world today is that we can be thought leaders. We can be philosopher kings. But we don't have to be broke, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and this is important. I'm also going to call out that the stage things are interesting because I came and I paced the stage. Those of you who know me know that I'm a consummate rehearser. I paced the stage and figured out that there were eight steps <laughs> that I could take. <laughs> and so now with the limits, I'm like, oh crap, I think that's seven steps. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to be honest here. I had a presentation prepared and I was going to give it TED style. I was going to come and give a series of slides and go through them in 18 to 20 minutes. And I decided not to do that. Um, after hearing sort of what we were talking about yesterday and wanting to incorporate some of the elements of what we talked about, I said, you know what? <coughs> Rather than just pushing this presentation, how about we have a conversation? How about we continue the thread of ideas? And so I talked to Andrea because my, my talk was originally only going to be 20 minutes. And it might now be closer to 30 minutes. So I want to say, one, thank you for giving me some additional time. And two, bear with me, because it won't have that precision <laughs> um, as I incorporate new ideas in. So there's an idea that runs throughout our culture that you either go big or you go home. If you're not going to play the game all the way and you're not going to do it on the stage, then you might as well give up, because this isn't for you. This type of business is not for people who are meek. And this type of business is not for people who can't get on stage and just be that powerful personality. We live in an age of celebrities. It's not true. Fundamentally not true. There's an alternative option there that ideally suits us. I've talked to a lot of you, and I've been in that seat as well, and I've never really liked that go big or go home personality. Because what if I wanted to go deep? What if I wanted to have meaningful connections with people? Does that mean I need to give up? No. So, title of the talk is Go Big or Go Home, or Go Deep. I can't hear the statement, go big or go home, without thinking of go big or go gnome, <laughs> <laughs> which is from Travelocity. Um, and so, that's why there's a gnome at the beginning of my presentation. Alrighty, so my grandfather was a, Quapaw, was a Quapaw Indian, and he had a statement that he used to govern sort of how he conducted his life. And that statement was, build a small fire and sit close to it. Um, what he and his people noticed is that when we made our fires too big, it became uncontrollable, and it, it just wasn't what it was when it was small. So he talked about this when he was you know, thinking about people who were buying too many homes, too many cars, 
making too many friends and trying to do too much in life. He would say, well, let's build a small fire and let's sit close to it. Um, let's think about it. It's a very simple statement, but let's kind of walk through it because we'll see some trends here. Let's imagine it's just you and a small fire. It doesn't require a lot to maintain and you can stay warm and, and you can be, you know, um, taken care of with this small fire. It can, it can sustain you. It also turns out that that small fire can sustain a few more people at the same rate, right? It can keep you warm and it can keep a few people warm. What often happens in life though is that as we have this really rock and fun fire, more people want to join. So what do we do? Because we care about people and we want to include people. We rearrange our, our seating arrangement and we make a bigger fire so that they can join too. Well, then more people want to join. So what do we do all over again? We rearrange it. So now we have this huge fire and we have all these people sitting around it. But think about it. We're not really that much warmer. In fact, we're often not as warm at all, or not as warm. And we can't talk to those same people like we used to. Those people that used to sit across the fire from us, we can no longer see. We're split up. And you used to be able to get by with just a little bit of wood, just a little bit of work to get that same amount of heat. But now you need a whole lot more. What I want you to think about is the heat to work ratio between this smaller fire versus this bigger fire. There's a lot more work being done to sustain that warmth for people, but you're still not as warm and you're still not as connected. This is the power of that simple statement that my grandfather said when you really think about it. The trouble becomes though that we build our businesses on the big fire mentality. We want more customers, more clients, more revenue, and more exposure. And it's more, more, more of the countable things. And there's a time and a place. But what we also have to recognize is that we reap some things when we make that bigger fire. We have more email. And by email, that's just all the, all the ways that we fall down you know, with communications. We have misunderstandings. We have scheduling problems. We have um, our communication channels get so cluttered and we almost get scared to go talk to those people anymore because we're so overwhelmed by it. We get more assistance because we need more help to tend this bigger fire. Okay? There's a lot more pressure when you've got this big fire that everybody wants some. So you, gotta, you get more pressure and we get more burnout because we're not as connected to that small fire and those people that we used to sit and talk to. Okay? Well, what we need to remember is that there are only so many meaningful connections we can have with people. If you look at the literature, people use Dunbar's number a lot. Robin Dunbar did um, research on cultures and primatology and notice that after 150 or so people, society started to break down. Communities started to break down and they had to splinter. Apparently, there are parts of our brain that can't track the relationships between all of those people. Because when you think about it, each social situation that you're in, you're constantly tracking who knows who, who's what. After 150, it gets really complex. Um, so there are natural limits to the amount of people that we can have meaningful relationships with. And this is just part of our, of our DNA, part of our encoding. And I just had a slide problem. Having a little bit of a technical problem, we'll get it fixed. Well, it turns out that you have a particular set of gifts, experiences, and perspectives that make you you. And only you have those experiences. There we go, we're back on slide now. Only you have those experiences. And I'm going to borrow um, an idea that Pam Slim used at one of our liftoff retreats of the idea of each of us has our medicine. She got it from the Navajo tradition. Um, and 
Each of us have a certain way in which we can heal the world, and only we have it. And part of the goal of our life is to share that medicine with the people who need it. It's interesting when you think about it, because we live in an experience economy right now. We live in an economy that has an abundance of services and goods, and you can no longer compete on services or goods. Think about the fact that we know that we can buy music from our favorite artist for $10 on iTunes. But many of us will spend you know, $25 to $100 to go see them perform, even though we know that the music is technically better from the studio. We know that, but we want to be a part of it. For the same reason, people go to the Super Bowl. I don't understand it. <laughs> I don't. I can see better from my living room. But there are people who like pay a lot of money, and there's a big fanfare because they want to be a part of that experience. Alrighty? It's very similar to what's going on with simulcast. Some people decided that they, they wanted to be a part of the live experience. Thank you for being here. Other people decided that it was a better fit for them to be a part of the simulcast. Thank you for doing that, too. Um, but there's a premium on experiences nowadays. Well, your medicine, when you think about it, is an experience that only you can deliver. The idea of the experience economy was really kicked around a lot around 1999 and 2000 in big business. Um, but they missed the boat. They were too big, too, too bureaucratized, and too slow to really be able to deliver peak experiences on a one-to-one -one basis. So the idea kind of got dropped, sort of. We are in the position to clean house here. No one can coach like you can coach. No one can write copy the way that you write copy. No one can run an online business the way that you run business. Um, only you can deliver that. All right, so part of us living in the world we live in means that we need to have an online component to our great work. As thought leaders, we would be remiss to not think about the ways in which we can leverage technology to get our message out there. Um, I won't go too long into it, but it's a great channel for distribution, marketing, and engagement. And you will miss out if you don't do it. So I'm going to assume that everyone in here has an online component, or everyone watching has it, because it, we would be remiss not to. Well, we need to remember that not all readers and users online are, are created equal. There are at least three different user psychographies that you can think about. 90% of the people who read your stuff online are just lurkers. And I don't mean lurkers in a bad way, like we don't want to look down on them, but they read your stuff and that's about all they do. They get the message and they go away. Their primary orientation to what you're doing is what's in this for me. That's what they're thinking. What's in this for me? And when they get what they want, they leave. About 9% of those users are what I call interactors. By the way, this model was put out by Jacob Nilsson from um, Use It. If you would like a link, just send me. I'll send you all the research here. Didn't want to put it all up there because it would just be gaudy. Um, <laughs> he calls them contributors. I call them interactors, right? Um, these are the people who they'll occasionally lead a comment. They'll occasionally buy something from you. They'll occasionally share something on social media. But they're not heavy users, OK? Their primary orientation is that, well, what they'll tell you is, this is for me. They'll interact with you and say, this is for me. Okay? And you can appreciate that, right? It's good to listen. There's 1%, though. These are your fans. Some people call them your champions. And they read everything you write. They share it with everybody. They buy your stuff. If you've got an advanced discount list or something like that, they're going to buy. <laughs> like, they get that email and it's done. <laughs> Alrighty. This 1% is really, really important. Their primary orientation to your stuff is this is for you. Meaning they take your message and take it out there in the world and say this is for you. So we have this sort of elevation in what people are thinking when they're using our stuff online. They're thinking, what's in this for me? 90% of people are thinking that. About 9% are saying this is for me. 
And there's 1% that's taking what you got and saying, hey, this is for you. Okay? Kevin Kelly on Technium wrote a brilliant article um, called 1,000 True Fans. And what he showed was that an artist in today's day and age can make a good living with the 1,000 true fans, fans using the model that I just talked about. True fans enable three different things for your business, or they do three different things for your business. One, they purchase more per person. They buy your stuff. The second thing they do is they will purchase directly from you. So imagine, say, 15 years ago, if you wrote a book before e-commerce matured, if you wrote a book, you had to sell it through either you know, the back of the stage or you had to have it in a bookstore. But now fans know that they can come to you and buy directly from you. And this is what's upsetting the music and publishing world because we have people that are now developing their own audience and selling directly. And so it's changing the conversation there. Not completely, Janet's looking at me. Not so sure about that. <laughs> Not completely, but it's changing the dynamics because your fans will come directly to you and buy from you. This increases profitability for you because you don't have middlemen. The third thing that's the most important for us, though, is that it enables new models of support, meaning there are new ways in which people will support your business. Your true fans are the ones that will go out there and say, hey, this is for you. They'll develop their own creative ways to market what you've got and to tell the stories about what you're doing. And this is enabling you know, dramatically different ways for us to get our messages out there. Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. You might be wondering, OK, this is awesome. How do I develop my fans? You develop your fans by delivering deep experiences. Three different ways you can think about deep experiences. You can think in terms of deep content, content that is so unique, relevant, and timely that it solves a problem in a very unique way. This is your medicine you know, in some type of distri distributable form. <laughs> okay? That's one way you can put out that deep content. This could be a book. This could be a highly immersive, interactive learning environment. Um, this could be a live event you know, where you're putting out great content. You can deliver deep experiences by developing deep relationships. This is where they have an unprecedented amount of access to you. And they get the best of what you've got. When you think about your clients or you think about the people who are powering your business, you can probably recognize that they're your fans. You can probably recognize that these are the people that show up for you. And what I like about it, personally, is that these are the people that are getting you to be the best you. Right? They're making you better because they're not the bottom end of your market, per se. Um, and they give you that space to experiment, to innovate, and to try new things. And this is important. The last way we can cash out deep experiences is by deep contribution. Deep contribution can be a synthesis of deep content and deep relationships. But we all can look back to some person in our lives that was there for us, that helped us get from one place to the next. And without that person, we probably wouldn't have done it. Think of that powerful coach that you met at the right time. Think about that powerful leader that showed up and said, hey, we can do this, and here's how we're going to do this, and we're going to do this together, right? This is powerful stuff. OK. So we're in business, and we're in the type of businesses that I really love to support, because we try to develop win-win scenarios. We give wins to our clients and customers, but we're also grounded and wise enough to know that we can get stuff in return. And that's the point, win-win. We are business people. We solve people's problems. And we're helped in return. So I've just showed you what deep, relations, or what deep experiences do for your fans. Here's what they do for you. Okay? That deep content is your great work. And I am stealing ruthlessly from Michael Bungay-Stanier, who I probably just butchered his name. But um, Michael Box of Crayons is what I call him. Yeah. <laughs> I, could, I could pronounce it, and it's not as awkward. So great work is that legacy work that is just great for you because it pushes you, and it helps you develop into the type of person that you want. And it's great for your recipients because it makes a monumental difference. 
you know, we all intuitively know the difference between good work and great work. And Michael was brilliant for encapsulating that. <laughs> Deep relationships mean more impact for us. I mean, we really get to be there for our people and help them make a change. We get to show up in the right way and in the best way. And deep contribution means more profit, which you might be wondering, how do you get more profit out of deep contribution? Well, there's two ways. One way is because these fans are the ones, th these people that are your right people are the ones that will be able to most use your high-end um, services and products. They are the ones who are ready. And they are the ones who you're not marketing to, you're not selling, you're showing. That's a huge difference. When you develop a product and you say, hey guys, this is what it is, and they're like, I'm in. Okay, those are your right people. And high-end models, as Andrea will talk about, have dramatically different um, profitability ratios in your business. But there's a second way in which they increase profitability in your business. What we need to remember first, though, is that your best customers and clients aren't your repeat buyers. Repeat buyers are good. Your best customers and clients are your promoters. Think about the psychography of those fans. They say, this is for you. They are already your promoters. Now, let's go back to enabling new models of support. I told you we'd come back to it. To explain how powerful this um, fan model is, especially in online business, I have to go through just a little bit of network theory. Trust me, it's not that bad. All right, so I'm going to simplify it. The value of a network increases exponentially with each new node that at, that's added to it. If you've ever heard of people talk about the network effect, you've probably heard of them talk about fax machines, because that's the one people kick around. Let's make it more human, though. Let's imagine a situation in which one person can only have three friends. Okay, let's keep it simple for now. In your first degree network, there are three people. Total makes four people counting yourself. Remember, the value of a network scales exponentially. In your second degree network, there are nine people, making for a total of 13 people. Now, keep your eyes on the ball. In your third degree network, there are 27 people, which makes for a total of 40 people. In this very, very simple model, Remember Dunbar's number? Here's how that looks. You take 150 people. In your second degree network, there are 22,500 people. And in your third degree network, there are over 3 million people. Now, this quick thought experiment breaks down a little bit because it's often the case that we know people in common. I know Pam and I know Andrea. They know each other. And so it breaks down a little bit, but you still get the fact that these things scale quite quickly. And what I want you to remember is it's not that three million people are gonna be buying your stuff. It doesn't work out that way. But what if you can tap into 2% of that? 2% of a three million people is still a lot of people. You know, <laughs> it really is. And you'll keep seeing this theme come over and over again. You can get access to those millions or to those hundreds of thousands of people by focusing on a few people. Because what happens when you're a deep contributor to some of that 150 people that you know? They become leaders. They become people with their own message, their own following, and their own fans. And they are one of your fans. So you're helping them. And they're taking it out to their people and they're saying, hey, this is for you. Um, because that's how we actually orient ourselves to the world. When we find something good, when we find some good chocolate, you tell your friends about it, right? When we find some really good medicine or something that, that changed our lives, we naturally want to share it. And if you're changing people's lives, they naturally want to share you. Now, the interesting thing is, you can't control your extended network. You can't really do much. Your message is going to leave you and it's going to change. And this is one of the interesting things about being in the world that we're in right now is a lot of the big businesses are having trouble figuring out the fact that 
there are people on Twitter tweeting, tweeting about their brands, tweet, tweeting about their messages. And they're like, no, no, they're getting it wrong. They're telling the wrong message. It doesn't matter if they're telling the wrong message. What matters is that they're telling the message. <laughs> OK? So the best thing that you can do for this extended network is not control, but to listen. Because they will tell you how they're using your medicine. And they will give you new ways of developing that medicine for new situations. As a quick aside, I had somebody write me and tell me that they were using some of my planners um, to do some, or they were planning their newsletters. I, I create planners for bloggers. And it's basically so that you can go through and you can think about what you're going to write about. And this fan just wrote back and she was like, I love these. I'm using them for my newsletters too. I never thought of that application. Probably never would. Um, I had another mom write me. I'm using these to help my kids with their writing assignments. I never would have thought of that. Did I tell her she was wrong? No. <laughs> I said, great. You know, use it however you want to. That's the point, right? Get something done. So you can't control your extended network, but you can lead your leaders. And that's all you can do. And you lead them through inspiration, and you lead them through contributing to what they're doing. I'll be very clear here. My model of leadership is not about what you can get from people, but about what you can give to people. That's the point of being a leader. We serve the people that we're leading. They don't serve us. Say what again? Just what you said. Oh, <laughs> the point of leadership, my view, people, people have different views on this, is that we serve the people we're leading. They don't serve us. Um, I learned this lesson in many different occasions, but most notably overseas. Um, when I was deployed as a junior officer, you learn very quickly that you're not there for yourself and your soldiers aren't there for you. You're there for your soldiers. And so um, you take care of them, and good things happen. You don't, and things fail. That's the bottom line. So same thing ports here. You take care of your leaders. You contribute them. You help them develop their message. You help them develop their fans. You help them make a difference in the world. Well, you might be thinking, that's great, but this still requires this big personality that I don't have, right? I'm quiet. I, I, I don't know about this whole leadership thing, right? I don't have the charisma for it. Well, it turns out that controlling, charismatic, and celebrity personalities don't do well at this. They don't. They try to control too much. They try to do everything by force of personality. And there's only so far you can influence that way. It also turns out that results-driven, humble, and contribution-focused leaders rock at developing leaders in this amorphous environment. This is from research taken um, from Jim Collins' Good to Great. It's a great book. Please read it. Um, and you might be thinking, OK, that works for you know, corporate business. right? That works for where we're in this model where they work for us and we tell them what to do. Um, but if you look at it, this applies in corporations. It applies in the military. It, require, it, it applies in politics as well. You'll find that if you do the research and if you look, it's always the results-driven, humble, and contribution-focused leaders that are making a difference. Oftentimes, they're behind the scenes, which is sometimes a tragedy because we don't see them. We see the person on stage, not the people behind them. But when you think about it, results-driven, humble, Contribution focused. It sounds like people who are delivering deep experiences to me. There's a correlation between successful leadership models and deep experience providers. That's very important. And it doesn't matter that we're no longer in corporations. It doesn't matter that we're not in a hierarchical organization. The principles of leadership remain the same. It's like sound strategy. Sound strategy does not change with technology, and it does not change with fads and the tides of time. You just have to apply them in a new context. Okay? We live in a world in which careers are in transition. Right? We're, we're sort of understanding the fact that we as um, workers or as employees have to manage our own career and be prepared for the boot. Right? 
This is a new world. As we're also in a world in which the cost of starting your own business is so low that many people are starting their own business. Online business, and then they'll do different things, but we're still in an age of what I call entrepreneurialism, where we're all thinking about the fact that we have got to add value or we're done. That's what entrepreneurs do, right? We generate new sources of value or we transmute or we transfer value from one source to the other. So we're becoming entrepreneurial in that way. And it doesn't matter that we're in sort of this wild, wild west period. The principles of leadership are the change, and we just need to change the context in which we lead. So, I'm in a technical problem there. All right. You might wonder about the scale of time that I'm talking about here. How long does it take to do this? And you might be thinking, I've been at this for a while, and I'm still not there yet. OK, so let's take Seth Godin here, one of my heroes. You probably all know of him, or might afterwards. He started his first business in 1974. His first paid marketing gig was in 1978. And he didn't become an accepted cultural thought leader until around 2000. That's 24 years. I asked Seth about this to see, because I know a lot about him, but I wanted to get the story right, so I just asked him. I thought it was around 2003 with Purple Cow, but we can disagree on where it is. He knows his career better than I do. Um, so it took Seth Godin 24 years, but look at what he can do now. He's consistently one of the top 1% of um, speech, uh, speech givers. Every book he writes is a bestseller. Every idea that he puts out <laughs> is taken up and talked about, right? He's got a large following of fans. And you think, OK, he's a big personality. But when you actually look at it, he only works with a few people. He's got a very small team of people that he mentors, works with, and influences. But it has huge effects in our society. And it took him a while. It seems that it doesn't matter how long it's taken you, is that you're building something worth building that you, could, that you should think about. Not how long it's taking you, but whether what you're building is worth building in the first place. So there is a place for quantity. There's a place for more customers, more clients, more revenue. And when they fit in with what we're doing, bring them on, right? That's what we want. But the same thing that makes up coal makes up diamonds. It's put together a little bit different. And at the same time that we're thinking about more, 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 let's think about better, better, better in quality. <coughs> All righty. The whole point of this event is to get you to think about how you are going to lead. I'm a coach and teacher first before I'm a presenter. I'm working on the latter, but hey. Um, so I want to leave you with four questions. One, what's your medicine? What are you uniquely able to do in this world? What problems are you able to solve? What challenges are you able to address? And using some of the exercises we talked about yesterday, what's your particular spin? Is it that you're a trained Shakespearean act actor? Is it that you worked in a record store? Is it that you're simultaneously a philosopher and <laughs> a veteran? You know, We all have different things that make us us that enable us to have a particular impact in the world. Second question, who are the people who can most use what you've got? Who are the people who can most use it? Not necessarily who will buy it. There's a difference that I want you to think about there. We can sell some things to some people, and that's cool. But when we really get into our great work, when we really get into our deep experiences, it's not for everybody. And you know what? That's good. Three, how will you deliver deep experiences? How will you deliver deep experiences? I've told you what to do, not how to do them. And how are you going to lead your leaders? 
And what I really want to leave you with is when is your fire big enough? When are you getting enough value and warmth and goodness from the fire? And when are you sharing it with the right amount of people? And when is it too much? Because when it's too much, you can start thinking about, well, is it quantity? Is it quality? What needs to change? What do I need to drop so that I get back to this smaller fire? Thank you for sharing this experience with me today and for giving me the additional time to slow it down. Um, I've really enjoyed it. It's been a deep experience for me. And you can't see the slide, but if you'd like to learn more from me, I'm here. But you can also find me at Productive Flourishing. Thank you.